And I think we're live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's exciting, exciting event. You are here in a um, on the day four of the Make for Tomorrow Festival. So Make for Tomorrow, apologies if you've heard me say this a thousand times before because you've been coming along to all the stuff we've been doing. But in case you're new, big welcome to you, as is to everybody. But um, Make for Tomorrow, it's an online arts program and festival. We're in our festival week this week um, where some extraordinary visual artists and some amazing people from the world of film and television and literature have been coming together and we've been joining to um, explore creativity and chat about life and art and uh, just to really connect you know it's a very very weird and difficult time and I think although it's virtual coming together is as more important than ever so thank you so much for being here so yeah my name's Lucy I work for Sussex Partnership Trust I'm their arts and health lead so our program our service is called Make Your Mark this whole thing is being delivered in partnership so we've got the amazing hospital rooms if you've not heard of them check them out google them they're amazing they get visual artists really brilliant visual artists into mental health settings to work with people to make those spaces more dynamic more positive places to be they're completely brill so they've been doing lots of great stuff with us with their visual artists and then we've also got the fabulous arts over borders who have been curating a series of really exquisite in conversations with some extraordinary performers um, and I know that this afternoon is going to be is going to add to that wonderful list. So without further ado, I will hand over to Liam, who is from Arts Over Borders. He'll tell you a little bit about what they do and then he'll introduce you to these extraordinary women we've got chatting with us this afternoon. Oh, just before I say my goodbye. So this is interactive. We love to hear from you. So if you underneath your screen, there's a little button and it says ask Minnie a question. So please do any comments, any questions. We really want to hear from you. You can just tell us what you're thinking about how the conversation's going or anything anything that you want to ask either her or Miranda please do get involved when you press it it'll go through to a little google form type it in click submit and it'll come through to us here in this virtual space all right well enjoy the conversation everyone and uh, over to you Liam sorry to interrupt Liam sorry. you're on mute. sorry sorry I'm on <laughs> I'm um, sorry, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, I work with my colleague, Sean Dorn, um, as Arts for Borders, uh, as Lucy mentioned. We operate across the UK and Ireland, uh, curating arts festivals, individual events, um, with a particular focus on site-specific work, uh, looking to create unique, unusual events that bring together artists and landscapes in interesting ways. So um, our role in Make for Tomorrow is to create a series of conversations in which participants talk about um, highs and lows about what gives them uplift, how they manage the insecurities and challenges of their life and work, as we all have to do. So um, I'm really delighted today to welcome Minnie Driver for this conversation. We're really grateful to Minnie for making the time to take part. And she's going to be in conversation with Miranda Sawyer. Um, besides her features and radio criticism for The Observer, Miranda's writing has appeared in GQ, Vogue and The Guardian. She is a regular arts critic in print, on television and on radio. Um, her most recent book, Out of Time, was an exploration of middle age and its potential. Um, there's a great review quote from the artist Jeremy Deller. Um, he wrote, I spent a lot of time nodding along in agreement to this book as if it was my favourite record. And Miranda broadcasts on Radio 4 and for the Culture Show on BBC Television. She's on the board of Tate Members, the South London Gallery and Sound Woman. And our thanks to Miranda for agreeing to chair this conversation with me. So that's it from me. I um, hope you enjoy the conversation and it's over to you now, Miranda. Okay, fabulous. Thank you, Liam. Um, and hello, Minnie. Hello. <laughs> hello, people out there and hello, uh, Minnie. So I'll do a quick introduction for you, Minnie, because I always think it's like nice to do it, even though everyone knows who you are. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I will say, so Minnie Driver is a fabulous um, actor, um, but also singer, which I think is sometimes overlooked, which I'm going to ask you about, but a fabulous actor um, who started, I mean, back in the 90s, you were already famous with things like GoldenEye and Sleepers, Gross Point Blank and uh, Goodwill Hunting, of course, which um, uh, that fabulous film and uh, has amazingly in terms of acting carried on working I always think I live <laughs> with an actor it's fantastic if people carry on working and make continue to make great work and you've 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 moved kind of more into the the TV side of things, which I think we're going to talk about, um, but you've made some really um, brilliant television shows. And I want to mention uh, about a boy, the riches and speechless in particular, but also, of course, Will and Grace, because we will be talking about that. <laughs> um, and um, uh, I, su I suppose really what I wanted to do to 
start off is to acknowledge that we're in quite difficult times and um, how that has been for you and how you've been managing uh, during lockdown, if you felt particularly, I mean, we could use the words um, desperate or bored <laughs> or emotional or how have you been? Well, I, all things considering, and when I think about where a lot of people are at, um, I've been all right and my son has been all right and so has my boyfriend and my family. Loads of people in my family have had COVID. They are all okay, um, thank goodness. Um, I read this really brilliant thing at the very beginning of our lockdown, which for us started on, it was the day after my brother's birthday, March the 10th yeah. and in LA. And I read this great thing in the New York Times um, talking about COVID sort of representing this low hum of menace. And it's stayed with me because there are still days where I wake up and I feel that, that sort of underlying pressure and even if the sky is blue or if it's raining, it's that that feeling that, you know, um, of our sort of our obligation to keep each other safe, to keep our families safe, but we have to carry on living and how do you do that? And all these things are not mutually exclusive. So it's, I think everyone is, every, every sentient person is feeling that responsibility and it's just a different way of living really, but... Um, yeah, it's interesting. I think it's sometimes um, I share a flat with my husband and two kids and that's great. You know, luckily we all love each other. And so far, you know, not too many rows. This is good. But there is a there was a point during lockdown when the kids were uh, learning, learning. I put in inverted commas at, at yeah. home. Um, my daughter definitely was not because I was in charge and I wasn't really very good at it. Um, where I thought, God, the idea of being in the flat by myself is um, as kind of exotic to me now as going to the Bahamas yep like I haven't been in the flat by myself no, that's that that is that is exactly it those moments and maybe for people who have been alone all the way through it it's like God, very I'm, different it's like it's exactly that it's the flip mm. we've all we've all got these we all share this experience of those things that we took for granted now being removed from us and how you navigate that how you navigate it with your mind how you navigate it in your heart and it's 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 interesting i mean as as adults how i don't know how many times after you've learned to drive and if you're lucky enough to have a kid and experience that maybe you learn a language or you learn the piano but doing something for the first time is quite rare for us and i've mm. noticed that as i've gotten older there's a weird you know inflexibility that's pushing me towards becoming like a granny shaking my fist on my porch like get off my kids get off the porch kids mm. you know and it's it's strange I see my kid being a lot more flexible than I am and I'm learning a lot from him about being what you know what what we've had to what we've had to give up or renegotiate like externally and internally yeah very true um do you have a particular technique if you're if like if you're going through a tricky time do you have anything that you particularly rely on to do like I'm, I'm thinking you know some people they like to perhaps go for a walk or just you know I don't know switch their phone off or they talk to a friend is there anything that reliably kind of sorts you out <laughs> <laughs> well it was before we we just moved back to London so that my son could go to school because all the schools were, you know, they, were, they weren't they were reopening in LA. They're virtual was, schools, aren't they? He was mm. just desperate to go to a brick and mortar school. And so, because my mum's 83 and my family's here, we decided to sort of just move back here for a while and see what happened. I used to, because I live by the sea in, in California, I would swim every single day. I swim, you know, whether it's November, December, January, um, I swim all year round. Moving back to London, I had to find something else to do. And I've been doing some wild swimming, which will clear your head and your sinuses pretty quickly. But- mm, I was gonna say, that's quite cold. It's not quite the very, same very, as LA. <laughs> very, very cold. Indeed. Although the Pacific is not really as warm. It's warm during July and August, but, so I've started running. I've started mm -hmm. running and I run and it does, it, 
does the same thing, which is it that swimming does for me, which it resets. It stops me thinking about other things. Um, and I play music. I play yeah. the piano. I play my guitar. I sing. I write music. Those are all escapes for me. And I think it's I've noticed in asking all my friends, everybody has their particular escape. And those for me, moving my body so that um, I'm really just listening to my breath running yeah. um, and figuring out the metrics of like what, it, of focusing, focusing very much in that moment. Um, yeah. That helps me a lot. There's something about running that I always think I'm a runner. I, I do run occasionally, but I'm quite a reluctant runner and I always think there's the first few bits like literally the first two minutes you're like oh my god what a terrible idea what <laughs> am I doing this is just dreadful oh my train is awful oh I'm gonna be sick Ugh. and then after a while there's a kind of rhythm to the movement that even if you're going I go very slowly I've literally been laughed at by teenagers you know <laughs> pointing at me as I'm going very slowly up a hill but it's just the kind of regularity of it there's something about that that sorts your head out I think it does it does my a really lovely friend of mine Jo she started a dance class for all of us kind of you know like I've done you know I've danced my whole life but never brilliantly but there's something about there is something about moving and feeling your body that it takes you out of your head it takes you out of your uh it takes you out of all of those that the, the thinking that kind of feels like it's crushing your skull all day long particularly during this time <laughs> yeah it's very um, true i think it's funny when you do something like a sport that's quite basic like so like swimming running dancing yeah. those kind of things because they very much associate you with the, being a child i think so when you're in the middle of something you know, I, I wrote a book about middle age. And one of the things that I've really felt is that when you're doing a sport that's quite simple like that, is that you could be any age. When you're doing it, you feel like you could be seven, you could be 37, you could be 67. There's no age to it because it's just a kind of thing that your body does for you while yeah. you just sit sit within it. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. I am um, a couple of my friends who use wheelchairs. They've said that, um, being it being outside and then if they're if they're able to use their arms of not using the electric mode anymore that a lot of them got wheelchairs that were manual again or they borrowed them or they found yeah. them because the same thing of going and finding that kind of um and I've noticed lots of people in Hyde Park in London I've noticed a lot of wheelchair users who see who are creating exactly the same thing like they've they're finding a rhythm um of movement and those that can't don't have use of their arms I have one friend who doesn't have use of their arms they just said that just being outside um and while their carer is pushing them they will sing or they will hum or they will listen to their breath and I think it's kind of by any means necessary of bringing yourself like into your body whatever that looks like um and focusing focusing your mind and keeping stuff getting making stuff smaller again in a way because it's it all feels so unmanageable like the, the situation at large our circumstances that feel so out of our control I think bringing things back into that moment where you do have some semblance of control yeah. um, there's freedom in that yeah I think that's very true it's interesting that you said um um, that uh, one of the things that the general kind of pandemic feel can do is feel like you've got a kind of low level buzz of anxiety along around and um, and also because you can't really do anything about it I think the problem with these big events is that you know yeah. all, all we can ever do we are not scientists we are not politicians it's all you can ever do is vote for a politician that you might like but other than that you can't actually do very yeah. much exactly. so <laughs> you exactly. have to go to the smaller things really yeah, you do, and, and 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 I think not not be ruled by the circumstance, but rather determine you, what your terms of engagement with the circumstance look like. That you, that you do have control over how you belly up to something, and um, unfortunately, often that is what is most tricky when if you have anxiety or or you know if or if you give in to that low level hum of menace. Yeah. Um, do you find I mean are you somebody who would like kind of doom scroll through your phone or anything because <laughs> I no, you know no, no you're good are you quite I, are you I, quite I, you I have, I, no and I now have a, an absolute kind of um 
I have a set amount of time that I let myself look at the news because it is, it, it, I, 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 I feel my solar plexus start to clench up because you just read all these terrible things that, that you can't do anything about. And while I do want to remain aware of what's going on, so I just sort of give myself 15 minutes to look through stuff and then that is it. There is no going back to it. If I want to go back to a newspaper, it's to do the bloody crossword. <laughs> That's it. I like it. That's a good technique. So listen, we were speaking just the other day because we were going to go and come and do this um this interview. And one of the things that um that I really enjoyed talking to you about, which is a little bit related to what you just said earlier, is when you first had a child. So I think if you um, are lucky enough to have kids and you want to have kids and you have a child, um, that is a very much a learning moment, isn't it? I mean, it's absolutely a, a, a complete bomb going off in whatever circumstance mm -hmm. that you're in. Doesn't matter when you have it, I have to say. I don't think it matters what age you are when you have a child. Um, and you spoke very eloquently about how that changed you. Should we talk a little bit about that? So. Before that, you described yourself to me as a kind of, before you had a child, as a kind of vagabond. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so how would you describe yourself before and how would you describe yourself after? Well, you know, before I was in the service of my career, you know, and I, I would, I, there, there would be, you know, various philanthropic, I was involved with Oxfam for many, 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 many years and with Save the Children. And there were things that I would be part of as well, but really I just worked and I had my little house with my books and my bed, but I was rarely there. I was off making films. And if I wasn't making films, I was visiting my family and everything, you know, when you're an actor, it is, it is pretty, it is a little bit narcissistic, if that's even possible. I think you're either narcissistic or not, because yeah. you are <clears throat> you are your brand, you're your product, you're the salesperson, you are the reason that you get up and go to work, you're who makes the money and the everything. Um, so it is pretty self-regarding. When you have a baby, suddenly there is this small person who cannot, you know, sleep on your mate Cliff's couch when you're shooting a weird independent film in Finland, which happened, you know, you can't, you can't do that. You, you're, you're in service to this, this little person. And it's amazing how my life expanded. I never, I never thought it could be bigger than all of those commitments. It seems sort of crazy to say that now, but um, work always felt like everything. Work and, work and my mum and my sisters and my brothers always felt like everything. And suddenly when I had Henry, there was this this whole other life available that that I sort of stepped into and it it forever changed the way that I viewed work and I I, I stopped making films to do television because I needed to be home with my kid I wanted to be on a television show that I was near my house in Los Angeles and I could make money being the sole breadwinner I'm a single parent and it just became very practical which I'd never been before you know yeah. I just I just been sort of, I just went with the flow of whatever work came in and what seemed like fun and a great idea. And suddenly it was like, well. And did, was there any point that you kind of mourned your old life? Because also I think it's very yeah. tough if you're in that situation and um, you have the support of a partner that perhaps you're living with, it's, it's different, isn't it? You know, if you're doing it on your own, that's a very different thing. And did you find it, did you ever mourn your old life? I suppose? Oh yeah, I, I, and I still, I still do sometimes. I mean, I, I really do. And I think that's okay. I think it's okay to mourn the things that we give up in favor of, of, of the new things in our life. And it's okay to feel, to feel sad. And I try not to let myself go down. Well, what would have happened if I hadn't done that? What, what would have happened if I sort of committed? I do, you know, I know a couple of actresses who, who, who definitely didn't compromise that. And um, they regret not having been around more for their baby's life, their young lives and stuff. I mean, there's always compromise, but yeah. you, I think, I'm not very good at being practical, but being a mum has really taught me to be practical. <laughs> you know, take another shirt because the baby will throw up on you on an airplane and then you'll smell of sick. 
yeah. like do that kind of stuff like be be prepared to be tired like it's <laughs> um, always bring a sandwich always bring a sandwich always, <laughs> you know um there's, there's there's certain things that you that you learn um it's it's funny i'm i'm just starting again now now my son's 12 now of doing more stuff for myself again and it feels like the, the it feels like such a rare treat it feels amazing to to be able to make plans and go gosh i actually could go off for a couple of months and i've got a really amazing boyfriend and um henry is my son is is really willing and able and wanting to be more independent so that's yeah. one of the gifts of being a bit older actually I mean, yeah it's a different stage yeah definitely a different stage um and um in those um early times i remember um when i my and i had support i was i mean my parents don't live anywhere near us and neither do my husband's parents but you know i had somebody else in the house mostly to help me look after um the children um, but there's still a, mo a moment I mean I remember very clearly there was a moment when I thought I have to leave the room now or I will throw the ba throw the baby out of the window <laughs> <laughs> and you know you kind of think okay somebody you know I literally have to put the baby down over here very safely <laughs> because otherwise I'm going to throw him out the window and um there is a quite um I mean, you do go a bit mad, is I suppose what I want to say, really. You know, you, lo you lose it through lack of sleep, you lose it through completely an alien um, situation where you don't feel like you're trained, you lose it because you might feel um, as though, you know, this is a massive responsibility yeah. <laughs> of, of, of somebody else's life there, really. Yes, you do. And I think in, in lieu of, for me, not having a partner and not having, you know, family was 7,000 miles away, my friends and my little community where I live in Malibu became, they, they became my family. They, they, they would offer up, you know, another pair of hands. And I mean, I knocked on more doors very early in the morning going, could you just hold him while I walk around the block? <laughs> <laughs> exactly this. <laughs> could you just let me go and jump in the sea for a minute just to clear my head? I mean, more people sit on the beach with my kid. I mean, it's 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 kind of it's kind of great, but but consequently, these people are now grandfathered into or grandmothered into Henry's life, and also that idea that you, um, I know it is a bit of a cliche that that it takes a village, but it really does. But you you sometimes have to be open to letting that village in, and as a yeah. single parent, you absolutely do. Um, and part of that was also why I wanted to do television because you can actually in in television in network television in America you can make more money than an independent film so it was like I need to get financial security so that when I do need to get a nanny whenever that is I will be able to afford to have that childcare. I mean it's it, it's so funny it it went it went from being this kind of super artistic life of of kind of flow and ease and blowing with the wind to being very, very, very sort of pragmatic about the choices that I made in my life and a bit more disciplined, which was not a bad thing in any way, shape or form. And how is the industry generally in supporting people with children? I mean, how have you found it? Well, I got to say, I made this film when Henry was three months old. I made a film called Conviction with Hilary Swank that mm. Tony Goldwyn <clears throat> directed. And I'd been in Tarzan with Tony. He was Tarzan and I was Jane. And we'd only we'd only met over an ISDN line, like recording the voices. <laughs> when I did this film with this brand new baby, and you know, I was feeding Henry every, you know, like whenever. All the time. <laughs> All the time. He directed, I've got pictures of him. He would wear, he would put the 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 uh, the um what was it called? Sling. Uh, yeah, he'd have the sling underneath. We were filming in Detroit in the winter, so it was minus 11. And he'd have Henry inside his puffer and wow. he'd just direct wearing Henry. And then they were all just amazing. Like when I needed to breastfeed him, the crew would stand around with their jackets off, like with me in a chair in the middle and they'd sort of stand facing out in a circle. And I'd breastfeed the baby for 20 minutes and then we'd go back to work. People are very, People, people, it is a, it's very community orientated, I found in my experience, people always wanted to, um, people always wanted to help and support that. Um, and it, 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 it worked out. 
Yeah. Do you think it would be different if you were like doing a different job in the industry? So if you were a sound person, for instance, do you think then it's harder? Yeah, I do. I definitely do. I think then you, because you, you, you can't, I mean, when you're, if you're shooting on a lot in at one of the studios, um, they have, they often have crashes and they have places that you can, you can book a spot and you can drop your kid off. Mm. But in terms of them, no, it was really rarefied. My, me being able to have my baby in my trailer or the director mm. wearing him was, that was extraordinary. But I think it's also because I work with people who were, who were nice. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> One of, yeah, that always makes a difference. If you work with people who are nice, it definitely makes a difference. There's a question here from um, a member of the audience who said um, about, given that we're talking about mothers, it says, um, being a mother in your industry must be difficult. Do you ever feel you were judged for judged for choosing that over your career? So for, you know, you've made certain decisions. Oh, you feel yeah. I mean, God, <laughs> I've read and it's, you know, it's really just, it was all, it, actually, I talked about this with my mum one time because it often, it felt like it was, women it was female writers who would sort of say you know oh the career's gone down a bit of a you know not as interesting a path as I thought it might have gone down you know that the idea that that things were over because you you weren't making I wasn't making the big movies or I wasn't making these choices that were way more in the public eye I was actually just doing stuff for me and my little tiny family of two um <laughs> and it it it's interesting how the the perception is that you've you've sort of given up some something, but you haven't. You've just added in something amazing and made different choices. Like I'm I'm still as as dynamic and invested and interested in the work that I do, whether it's in a short film, a big television show, a small film. Like it, it is so funny. Like I never. I never, I never look at the work as being any different, but it was definitely perceived as being like, oh, you know, that's It's interesting, isn't it? Because in the end, what it is, is a kind of, um, despite it's, that it's coming from, from women, it's a slightly male view of what a career should be. So yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's an idea that your career should always be interesting, that you have loads of control over it, that you should be doing this and doing that, and at a certain stage, you should move to this area. And of yeah. course, most people's <clears> lives, <throat> let alone, you know, no matter what you do, are, are less, they're not so streamlined. They're all over of the course, shop. It, it's not a it's not a straight it's not a straight line and it shouldn't be a straight line i did this short film with robert altman like i don't know 15 16 years ago and he said that the minute you start trying to 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 follow the kind of the zigzag of the opinions about you that's the big error allow the zigzag to just be the natural course of your life issue the idea of it being a straight line but the, the only straight line is really your connection to your love of what you do and, and how you build your life around that. Um, and you're right, I think that those female writers were definitely adopting a slightly more prosaic male view of, you know, women and the sort of the raised eyebrow of the women in the workplace. And of course, you're going to kind of get demoted, whether that's because you're not in in my industry, like in some big action movie with yeah. Tom Cruise. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a question here from another um, uh, person who's watching. Hello, thank you for the questions. We welcome them. Um, and it says, um, it's kind of what we've been talking about, but a very direct question, which is, have you ever experienced mental ill health? Mm -hmm. And what are your, what were your coping strategies? You did talk about your coping strategies for lockdown, but I suppose this is a more direct question if you've ever uh, oh. suffered from or experienced um, mental ill health. Yeah, I absolutely have. And I, I, um, I know it might, because there's always this, there's this patina about fame and about success of it being incredibly glamorous and it being wonderful and you're paid lots of money and all those things are true. But there is, it is like getting shot out of a cannon, um, being in the public eye, having paparazzi follow you around, having, you know, um, photographers try and take pictures up your skirt hoping it, it it's there's a there's there's a, there's a lot when I was young and first got famous it was it was an unbearably strange pressure and I would I didn't really cope with it very well and tried to maintain control often through it was really not eating that was kind of the the thing oh, that yeah. I did when I was younger to maintain control and while um 
my family sort of swooped in and and literally came and got me from LA and brought me back to London and sat me down and fed me and kept me out of the business for a minute to sort of get my head back on track. Um, but it was... Did you, had you recognised yourself that it was going a bit wrong or not really? Yeah, but I also felt like I, I couldn't say no, like when someone is offering you this work that you have, you know, you've, you've said this is all I want to do and this is what I want to do and it is such an incredibly hard business to start turning down work to go and sit at your mum's kitchen table it felt it felt completely terrible and awful mm. but I know that I am so incredibly grateful that they stepped in because I was deeply unhappy and not able to enjoy any of it because it was so frightening it was frightening being um written about the whole time not having any recourse this was before you of know of course it's before anything. twitter or anything like that you can't yeah, respond can you no recourse at all to answer what things would things that were written about you things that were not true you feel like you're going mad because you're being gaslit by the media in a way and you'd read mm. stuff in the daily mail before you knew not to read that stuff that was presented <laughs> as truth about you and you do feel like you're going a bit mad because you think well am i this person that is being described gosh maybe i am um so you kind of lose connection with yourself and that's very dangerous mentally and i think you act out in 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 all sorts of ways and i'm i was lucky yeah. to have the support it is very interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's actually another thing that we we learn a little bit around COVID is how much of our identity is wrapped up in seeing other people. Do you know what I mean? Or what other people mm -hmm. think of you. So, you know, when you're not going out very much, um, then to have a chance encounter, you know, in the park or people that don't know you, but respond to you in a friendly way is the kind of thing that lifts you up. So if you're in a public position and the, the response to you is not that nice positivity, then it's awfully, it just def, definitely does something to your identity or what you think about yourself. I think it's weird when you, you know, just, I can only speak from the experience of like the business that I've been in since I was like 19, is that you're, you're really, um, you're trading off on like public approbation of who you are, like it's so it's so tied up your sense of self is so tied up with the way in which you're perceived that it's really dangerous that if you haven't got a really strong sense of who you are and what it is you want to return to but you're rather going yeah give me give, give me all these give me a different mantle so that I can be someone else like quite literally and figuratively um I think psychologically it can all get quite messy if you don't really take yourself in hand and say okay this is this is where that part of my life ends, and this is actually who I am and who I know myself to be. And you can write whatever you want about me because I fundamentally know and feel who I am. And it it took it took a minute. It took a minute for me to get to that point. And I would really say that that having my son really genuinely ended that period of my life of worrying so much about what other people thought about me or or how I was or how I was perceived. Yeah, that is very true. I mean, it's very hard to be in a in a position where you have to be perceived for your job, yeah. <laughs> and then that to is, work out it, how you want yeah. to be. You know what and that what yeah. that can do to you. Yeah, that's it very. Some, it takes some work. It takes some interrogation, and perhaps that's a, a really good thing that we we do keep interrogating who we are. You do keep checking in with who you are and how you feel, what, regardless of what you do for a living. Yeah. Um, and realise that that work is is not the be all and end all of who you are, but you you sort of have to put in the time to um, to believe in that person outside of work. Yeah, that's very true. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about work actually, because um, I was very much enjoying uh, <laughs> researching your recent telly series, which not not all of which I'd say, but I really enjoyed them. So I wanted to talk to you um, um, actually particularly about Speechless, which is quite recent isn't it? it was in the last four years yeah. so um this was a sitcom it went on e4 um and it was made in america and you played the mum of three kids you're in a, a essentially a, a pretty normal family yeah. but you had three kids and the um oldest one has cerebral palsy so he's in a wheelchair played by uh, michael fowler he's called jj and then you have a son called ray and a daughter i can't remember what the daughter's called actually maya is that right no you're maya no i was maya her was name it? was Oh my God, Kylie. No, you can't remember now. This is so terrible. Oh well, anyway, there's a, there's a wee daughter. She's really sporty. And Ray is quite kind of like 
nerdy. And yeah. then JJ is himself as well. And what I really enjoyed about the whole thing is um, <laughs> your portrayal of a particular type of motherhood, which I can relate to. Um, and what that I think any uh, parent can relate to, but maybe particularly mothers, which is the idea that you um, have different roles in different situations. So your role is keeper of records. You know, yes. every time you go to the hospital, you're like, actually, I think you'll find that this yes. happened here and this happened here, you know, <laughs> and um, and also the person who says, well, he doesn't need me now. Let him go and do his own thing. And where and I really enjoyed that kind of balance of your character. It's very I mean, it's a very sweet and lovely and funny series. But that balance is what the bit that I really related to, I must say. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, she's a she's a she's a lion that that you know she's she's advocating for a child with a disability and also trying to kind of exist in the world. And she's, you know, very flawed and imperfect and <laughs> and sort of awful as well. <laughs> That's why but I like her. Lovely and great. <laughs> I mean, it was a it was a really really funny and fun character. And I, you know. The, 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 the families that I met shooting that show, the families of kids with disabilities, it, it is just, it is just amazing. It is amazing what that show did for families who suddenly saw a family that looked like them, that understood how difficult it is for the, the typical children in a, in a household with a, a child living with disabilities. Um, it, it's, it was incredible. It was incredible that it was so funny um, mm. and real and that JJ, he, you know, he's a non-ambulatory, non-verbal kid with cerebral palsy, but he's still like a grotty teenager. Yeah, he's a person. <laughs> he's, just, he's a person. He's still sort of horny, he wants to date girls, he wants to bunk <laughs> off school, like all these, all these things that uh, it, it was really, it was actually really groundbreaking. It was, it was very sad when that show was cancelled, but I think it, mm. it moved the needle on, on the conversation around disability, certainly in the States, which was great. Um, and I loved it. I loved, I loved that character. She is, she is, she's, she's, she's every mum, really. Yeah. yeah, you've played, uh, a lot of the characters that you've played, which I really enjoy about your um, character is, um, they are funny, Minnie. <laughs> they, are they, yes. they make me laugh. They, they do. do. That's good. <laughs> they and make I, me laugh. <laughs> you know what? That's good. And I've done my job. <laughs> you did it. So like, <laughs> do you particularly go for things or do people cast you because they know you you can be funny? I mean, do you get offered a lot of... Because you're, you know, obviously you've got a massive emotional range, but I do think that, you know, to be able to play funny is quite a tricky thing. It is quite, it is actually, I mean, I think, I think it is, it's, it's, um, it's harder to, it's harder doing comedy than it is doing drama, I found, uh, quite a lot harder, but way, it's just way more fun, it's way more fun laughing on a set all day than crying on a set all day, <laughs> I mean, I really, genuinely, it's just like, it's really lovely making people laugh, like when, and when you make the crew who's been there, you know, as long as you have, since sort of 5.30 in the morning, and by lunchtime, they're still sort of chuckling over a scene, like, it's nice, like, it feels good. That's why, like doing Will and Grace, like it just, it just felt good. It was just funny. It was just absolutely hilarious. I laughed from the minute I arrived at that job to the minute I go home at night. It, it was, it was heaven. It's so. brilliant, Will and Grace. I mean, do you want to like? I just want. I'd really like to hear your description of your character, Will and Grace, to anyone who hasn't, <laughs> who doesn't know who she is or her relationship with Karen. Would you like well, to explain? Karen, it. What it was meant to be was like, if Karen existed, if Karen existed in another form, like Karen had to meet her match. That was what they wanted mm. in Will and Grace. They wanted um, this sort of alcoholic, um, <laughs> completely morally bankrupt character, Karen, to have a counterpart. And like, that was me. And, you know, she was meant to be like, a, like everything about her was, was like in question, like, her gender, whether she was a hooker, whether she was like, you know, like involved in incest, like every single, every single boundary that you could, <laughs> you could create around what they just got rid of. And it gave, I think that gave the writers a chance to write all of the filthiest stuff that they've ever wanted to do and stuff that, you know, I think they got in quite a lot of trouble for a lot of the stuff they wrote for me. Like there was some 
you know, religious offense given. I mean, they, they didn't, they offended on every level with the character of Lorraine Finster. Yeah, um, it's equal opportunities offending, it, wasn't it? It was equal opportunities offending, but I do think it was fundamentally incredibly funny. Mm. Um, and Very much so. I, I absolutely... I, I it mean, reminded I, me a bit of Dynasty. <laughs> Every yeah. time you came in and, yeah. you know, in whatever fabulous outfit you're doing, exactly. you know, exactly. and um, and in whatever dramatic situation you are in, you and, and kind of Karen, so Lorraine and Karen, just rise up to kind of, you know, Joan Collins levels, I, I, I like to think. Which is always really fun. It's always really fun to see when, when no one's taking that seriously, but it's yeah. just, you know... Um, it was great. It was really, it was, it was amazing being, I was part of the finale, like the final final of like this last season. And it, it was the, the response of the audience in the room, like to all of those characters, like when, on, on the nights that we would tape, you know, in front of a live audience, it was like the, the best kind of theater. Cause it was, it was so immediate and funny and great. And I feel very, I just feel very, I feel very lucky to have been part of that. Um, for, for not having been you know a, an, an original cast member you know I feel like I was I was really part of it definitely and some fabulous outfits so look I'm um, slightly conscious of time we have a few questions here from the audience that I'd like to ask you um, and uh, here they are so um, one is oh I'm going to ask you this one because I like music so any poor any more plans to work with Tired Pony or other musical collaborations oh, yeah. so let's talk music Minnie yeah. so you yeah. I think I feel we should acknowledge the fact that you were a musician before you were an actor yes and what that I suppose I mean there's a very different thing around music and acting because obviously acting you're in service to the whatever you're acting really yeah. and music you're in service to something else and that quite often is you I mean, it's you, your your yeah. your creativity, where it takes you, and I wonder sometimes if you miss that because it's yeah. quite hard. I do. Yeah. I, I, that was really that is really the road, the road less travelled for me because it really could have gone either way. Like I, it just so happened that the band I was in when we were signed to Ireland when I was about nineteen, you know, they were then all. Um, they were all bad boys and all the money that we had for the record went to bad, bad places. <laughs> and um, that's so it, music. <laughs> oh my God. And, and I was just, I was in between broke trying to get another record deal when Circle of Friends came along and that forever altered the kind of the trajectory of my life. There was another moment where I, I could have signed a, a really big record deal quite early on in my career in Hollywood. And I and I didn't for, for loads of just really dumb young reasons of like, you know, they didn't want me to write my first record. And I was like, well, I'm a songwriter. That's what I'm, you know, I should have done it. Yeah. And then, but- And then altered it. Yeah, but you don't know you're young. But you don't know. And so you, you know, it, it worked out the way it worked out. And I have this, um, I have this great record label. I, you know, I've toured, I've opened for people. I've played with amazing people. I've made records. I still play music all the time. And to your point, whomever asked about Tired Pony, Gary Lightbody is one of my best mates. And oh. we, um, we played together at the Albert Hall just before the first lockdown. And it was honestly one of the great moments in my life. Like truly, I've never, I've never played anywhere as extraordinary. Um, I've never had a night like that. And Gary lives in um, LA and we write together and we definitely have plans to, to, to write more music together. I'm hoping that he'll do another Tired Pony. I think that, I think he's really doing a lot of Snow Patrol stuff that was cut yeah. short because of COVID and that'll be like 2021. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a, I'm doing this this show, Modern Love, for Amazon. Actually, I'm going to Ireland to shoot that uh, next week. And I'm going to be doing the music for that episode. Oh, so amazing. I'm starting to try and just really work that into all the deals that I do. It's like, yeah, I'll do your, I'll do your thing, but you've got to let me do some music as well. Yeah, so, nice. Sing yeah. the theme tune, write the theme tune, get yeah, in. Exactly, write the theme tune. That's exactly it. <laughs> Okay, so here is a, um, another question here. Um, does home mean something different to you since lockdown, especially considering you've moved countries? Oh, golly. Yeah, it does. 
home is uh, uh, and you know what's what's even what's weirdly meta about that is when you're moving countries but you're moving back home but it hasn't been your home for 25 years that is a real mind twist um because you're sort of you don't want to retread the past it's like how do you form a new bond with your old home and you start mm-hmm. realizing that it's it's so much about what you bring to it so it it it's not my new relationship with London is my new relationship with London and with England that has always been there and is always so, you know, I'm, I love it, it is my home, but I really ache for, I ache for the Pacific Ocean. That's what I ache for. I Listen, just, I ache for LA and I've never lived there. You know what, it's such a weird, <laughs> such a weird place. It's a weird, completely, you have to drive everywhere. It's really strange. There is a massive lack of community. But, you know, my little tiny community that I have, I miss them so much. But that the whole the whole repeated truth, which is ultimately what a cliche is of home is where the heart is. It's it's true. And your heart can be in more than one place. But I think it's about you setting up what what do you need? Well, I need to be able to. I need to be around my books and my kid, not in that order, in the other order. (laughs) Just in case he ever watches this. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Okay. Okay, So also this is, this actually locks into one of the other questions, which is what have you guys turned to film and TV wise to get you through lockdown? But I mean, you just said books. So what have you been reading or watching or or listening to? Well, I, um, I always listen to This American Life, a podcast, which I just cannot recommend highly enough. Yeah. Excellent. Um, It's just brilliant. And I also love the podcast, How to Fail. Um, With Elizabeth Day. It's completely brilliant. Um, I'm actually prepping a podcast myself, which is loosely based around Proust's questionnaire. It's, Sounds uh, good. I, you do I, know I, I review podcasts, Minnie, oh, so, so I will be, be reviewing it. <laughs> but I'll be having you on as well. <laughs> that's a bit weird. I review myself. I like, you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let you, what, that's exactly what you should do is review your episode. Um, <laughs> and it will be fair. Um, but I read this, um, I've been going back and rereading in, in weirdly in lockdown, I've gone back and reread a lot of books that I loved. Monsignor Quixote by Graham Greene, uh, The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, um, Middlemarch, yeah, um, some Anita Bruckner, yeah. Lack, um, and then I read this book Born to Run, which changed the whole way that I run it's all about kind of free running and about this tribe in the mexican mountains um who are ultra runners just by virtue of their um where they live and how they need to get to visit each other it's it was an extraordinary book so i've been doing lots of that i watched um 30 rock from beginning to end i cannot recommend it highly (laughs) enough it is what it is it is a perfect it is a perfect tv show i mean that's not true there is some problematic stuff. There's, there's some deeply problematic stuff. Apart from the deeply problematic stuff, comedy it's wise, perfect. it's perfect. Yeah, I mean, there's deeply problematic stuff in many things. We could talk about The Godfather, but let's move on. So look, um, I am very aware of time, so I'm going to ask you one more question, and then um, and then we have to go, unfortunately. And it is, um, uh, it's actually the first question that anybody asked, but I have, I'm coming back to it. And it is, Minnie, have your understanding of yourself changed over the last six months? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it has. It really has. Um, I, um, I've realized how, how much I want to free fall off a cliff in response to high stress. Like I just want to like, I want to throw myself off the cliff and just sob and cry and have a big dramatic reaction. And I've realized having cliff dived frequently in my household with my boyfriend and my son, now looking at me just in complete sort of wonder and now completely bored by it, I now stand on the edge of the cliff as opposed to just throwing myself off. Nine times out of 10, I will now just stand on the edge of the cliff with the wind blowing in my hair (laughs) and decide not to and take a breath and try and deal with things slightly differently. So 
yeah, I've seen what a bloody drama queen I am and how the only person who can stop that happening is me, which is really annoying because I would like somebody else to be able to stop me being me. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much for talking to us, Minnie. It's been absolutely lovely. Oh, I've really so enjoyed much. it. It's really been really, fun. really fun. And I'd say thank you very much also for um, all the questions from everybody watching because they've been really great and really, really great. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. Oh, that was lovely. Thank you, Minnie. Ooh. Thank you, Miranda. That was just a really... Well, I mean, actually, you went pretty deep and thank you for being so open and so honest. And I think, I know I appreciated that and I know loads of people listening will have as well. But also you brought some fun and some lightness and I think, my gosh, do we need that? Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, it was a really dynamic conversation. Brilliant. And thank you so much to everybody who's been tuning in and posting in your questions. Yeah, it added a kind of an energy to the conversation, which was just really exciting and really beautiful. Um, so we're finishing a little bit earlier today. So I just want to say a big thank you to our funders. So a big thank you to Arts Council England um, and NHS Charities Together who contributed um, the funds to make this whole programme happen. The brilliant charity at the Trust Heads On fundraised for us to make all this stuff happen. So a big thank you to them. And also, I'm so sorry because I didn't name check them at the beginning. And technology is not my favourite form for everything. Um, so the amazing COG app, who make sure we've got all of this set up, the right buttons, the right links, and that we can all kind of come together and share in these virtual moments together. And like I said at the beginning, they are so important. Having this fellowship, having this time to chat, and I know it is different. It is very, very different, the connections that are made. But nonetheless, they are really important, and they're really, yeah, necessary. And um what was I saying to a friend this morning? They're a bit soul soothing and we all need that. We definitely all need that. So thank you everyone for being here. Again, thank you, Minnie. Thank you, Miranda. And I think that's it from us for this afternoon. Do you come back tomorrow. We've got two really exciting events and we've got um, a chat about the beautiful Sophie Clements film in the morning with Tim from Hospital Rooms, who's been a key person in making all of that happen. And some of the people from the hospitals where, um, where participants have contributed their work. And in the afternoon, we've got the amazing Richard Wentworth artist having a chat with the actor Rupert Vines and a brilliant art psychotherapist from the Trust. So they're all gonna be having conversations. So two great things. So do please come back and join us. Everything is live here on the Make Your Mark website. So we hope you can join us then. But for now, it's a massive goodbye. And thanks for being here, everyone. Bye. Thank See you. Ya. Thank bye. you. Bye. 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 See ya. Bye. Thanks. See ya. Bye, love. Bye.